since continuous default to legislative contracts. It has been pointed out on many occasions in this debate only one contract has, been avoided, has avoided this legislative hammer since 1994. The use of the hammer of, le of legislation and the current government's redesignation of education as an essential service in 2002 means that teachers do not have an effective voice in the negotiation of their collective agreement. And this is, I believe in part, why the BCTF is forced to take such strident and militant positions as it approaches the bargaining table. Allowing the organization to be characterized by many as unreasonable in its demands and fostering an untenable situation leading to strike action, which gives the government the excuse it needs to use its legislative hammer. I cannot support Bill 22 and will vote against it on all readings, Madam Speaker. I believe the court will strike down parts of this bill and, taken as a whole, the bill merely exacerbates the dysfunctionality of the K-12 bargaining system. Simply put, Bill 22 will rob more of the magic from our classroom. However, I feel compelled to offer more than simply criticism and opposition to this bill. So I will offer a proposal that could start to move us in, that, in a direction that I believe the majority of British Columbians would want us to move in, towards a resolution to this untenable situation. First, I believe government must begin to view education spending as an investment to be maximized, not a cost to be controlled. For every dollar we wisely invest in the K-12 system, we save hundreds of taxpayer dollars in avoided costs in the justice system, the health care system, the social system, and in government-funded workforce adjustment and training costs. We need to stop protecting education funding, which is simply a euphemism for not funding it at the rate of inflation, and start strategically and thoughtfully reinvesting in it. To this end, I propose the government restore the industrial school tax rate that it cut in 2008 under the guise of stimulus package and now rationalizes as part of its revenue neutral carbon tax. The additional revenue from this restored school tax should be directed to increase education budget over currently committed and forecast. An increase of $228 million over the next three years and at least $80 million annually thereafter. I'm sure that the industrial and farm ratepayers will agree that they are one of the primary beneficiaries of a well-resourced education system in BC. The government should also immediately put an end to the requirement that school districts pay for carbon offsets. It is immoral and unconscionable to continue to take more money from school operating funds for the bogus claim of carbon neutral government. This will restore $4.4 million per year to schools for education purposes, approximately $13 million over the next three years. The government should also publicly, and I understand the minister has done this already, commit to return any accrued savings from the teacher's strike to the school system. At $11 million a day, this could be as much as $55 million if the full strike is realized. This will mean $228 million in new money and about $70 million that is truly protected money will be available to address both collective bargaining and educational change issues in BC. As I stated in my response to the budget, I believe there are other revenue measures the government can take so they can increase investments in critical public services without impacting BC's economy or investment climate. But today I wanted to stick with a suggestion that can be directly tied to investment in the K-12 system. As a quid pro quo for this additional and protected money, I would hope that both the BCTF and BCPC would take it upon themselves to put forward thorough and thoughtful suggestions for where there are cost savings in the system. I don't believe there are no administrative and logistical savings that BCPC can't recommend to government. In fact, I think the whole system is administratively top heavy. Nor do I believe that the BCTF cannot find savings that might accrue to the system from rationalizing and standardizing benefits packages or by examining the number of pro-D and NI days, professional development funding, sick days, etc. It would be a sign of maturity and good faith by all parties if they all looked at the system through the lens of the current fiscal realities and offered cost savings that would move them towards net zero as many other collective agreements with public sector unions were able to achieve. However, the government must also be more honest and admit that it has not protected education funding and commit to providing the additional finances I suggested earlier. The second set of recommendations I want to make are complicated by the fact that we're smack in the middle of an ugly dispute and both sides are thoroughly entrenched. 
These entrenched positions will invariably lead to yet another legislated agreement. No one wins in this situation, especially students in British Columbia's classrooms. Therefore, I recommend that the government withdraw Bill 22 and instead work with BCPC and the BCTF to agree to the cooling off period that's contained in the bill until August 31st, 2012. During that period, an industrial inquiry commission should be convened to work with the parties to address, examine, and report on three items by August 31st, 2012. First, the implications of Justice Griffin's decision and recommend a mechanism to address class size and composition in the current and future collective bargaining process that agrees with the spirit and intent of that decision. Second, the rationalization of district versus provincial issues and recommend a template for the first truly province-wide collective agreement, as Don Wright indicated in his 2004 report. And then 